You're listening to the Ambition Incubator podcast, and I'm your host, Deirdre Morrison. I'll be sharing some bite-sized brain science, thought-provoking questions, and mind-bending ideas about how our brains work, change, learn, and adapt, and how we can use the knowledge emerging from the field of neuroscience to open up new possibilities and make the progress we want in all areas of our lives. Hey there, welcome to the show. So today we've got what my brother would call a humdinger of a brain teaser. It's all about how we see the value of our development and what we want from it. So to start off, let me ask you, how likely are you to invest in the technology or systems required to do your work? Even if this isn't something you do proactively, there comes a time when it's no longer a choice, right? Like when the government switched from paperless to online tax submissions. What about your skills? Is that something you'd invest in? Well, that seems like a no-brainer, right? And for many, it's not even an option. Quite a lot of careers require continued professional development at some level, even if you're not looking for promotion. And what about yourself? Is that something you invest in? I realize you're probably doing a mental double take right now and maybe wondering if I wasn't listening to myself a few minutes ago. Yes, I did ask if you invested in your skills. And then I asked if you invested in yourself because they're not the same. And despite my involvement with personal and professional development, I have to confess that it was quite recently that I made the distinction between these two things. It turns out that while many of us recognize the need to invest in our skills development or the machinery of our business, we do often overlook investing in ourselves. And that got me thinking, what's the difference? Why is it important? What what does it mean? Well, let's look at the difference first. If we invest in our skills, we expect to get something to make some progress, we expect to see a return on this investment. Our careers will benefit, or our businesses. So I'm not talking about hobby skills, which are great, and we will come to those in a while. Investing in ourselves is different. It doesn't necessarily expect a tangible reward. Investing in ourselves can, of course, produce a reward, but if there's nothing tangible to be gained, then sometimes (laughs) there's a little bit of an attitude of, what's the point? Interesting, right? Okay. Why is this difference important? Well, in my humble, though sometimes opinionated view, we can be very results driven, very oriented towards something that can be quantified. If I complete X training, I can apply for Y promotion and expect Z in my bank account or the entrepreneurial equivalent. Take your pick. So it's easy and relatively safe to invest in skills or professional development or certifications and so on. And of course, it makes sense both to ourselves and those around us. So if you tell someone you're investing, say, $3,000 in a business-related program or training, pretty much everyone goes, good for you, well done, you totally should do that. However, if you say, I'm going to spend 3 k on something that isn't leading to something, then eyebrows start getting raised. There's definitely a distinction between development and personal development. It's as though we're risking or possibly wasting something by investing purely in ourselves without expecting a return. But at the end of the day, we have one life that we are sure of and one existence in which to live it. So why would we not want to make that the best and most fulfilled experience? And this definitely raises some questions, probably best addressed by this classic exercise. Feel free to pause the podcast and try this out if you can. First of all, take a sheet of paper and list on it the people and animals that you love and care about in your life. Number the list as you go. It can be as long or as short as you like. And when you've finished, glance over the list and notice how far down the list you got before you listed yourself. Did you include yourself? A lot of people don't. We're not really prepared for this concept of self-love being anything more than lip service. But tied up in self-love is a lot more. Self-compassion, self-confidence and self-acceptance. And this is why I'm dwelling on this question about the distinction between development and self-development. It occurs to me that this is part of a wider thing. So, as you might know if you've listened to previous episodes, I'm not a big fan of some of the effects that the education system can have. But as an advocate of lifelong learning, I'm obviously not against learning. In fact, I'm all for it. One of the effects of mass education that I tend to rail against, though, is that we end up in some kind of race as soon as we start in the school system. And learning becomes all about keeping up or keeping ahead. And that isn't really what learning needs to be about. Sometimes it is just for the joy of it. It's for the experience that it gives us, the new perspective. 
or to enhance our appreciation of this life that we have. And to an extent, those hobby skills that I mentioned earlier, they slot in here very nicely. But what about going even further down this rabbit hole? What if you had the opportunity to do something that wouldn't necessarily give you anything tangible, even in the form of a hobby, but it would give you a certain je ne sais quoi of awareness or calm or even mental flexibility? Is that something you'd plow that hard-earned cash into? Is it something that you'd spend your time on? You know, looking back, when I decided to go to art college instead of doing science or languages, the big question that people asked was, and what will you be able to do after that? And (laughs) aside from being a little irritated by the question, I have to confess I didn't really understand it. I guess it just didn't make sense to me that they thought I was learning to get something. It didn't make sense that they thought I was doing anything more linear than exploring anything and everything. It didn't make sense that they thought I had a plan at 17 years of age, for goodness sake. And I still don't correlate the degree with the positions that came after. I know that any single one of them would have been open to me with any degree I chose to do. It's less about what you know and more about how you apply what you know in my way of working. Because as Napoleon Hill put it, knowledge is not power, it's only potential power. And we all hear about the overqualified degree holding employees in very basic positions, many of whom did far more sensible degrees than I did. So here was the question I had to ask myself upon realizing that I had compared the value of doing something that was totally for myself, something that was literally about me getting to know me better, and I was comparing it in monetary terms with the price of another qualification or certification. And don't get me wrong, I'm not overly hung up on qualifications, but I do love me some learning, so they become very tantalizing as a way to get that. But the moment where I caught myself comparing the price tags on these two things, it stopped me in my tracks. I had questions to ask. Why was I hesitating to spend this money on myself? Why was I not following the white rabbit as freely as I would have in earlier choices? Was I starting to lack trust in my instincts? And if I didn't trust those instincts, you know, that sounded a lot like a lack of confidence in self and also a lack of value in self, internal value that did not need to produce anything or expect to number crunch the return on the investment of what I'd learn. There are some things that can't be crunched and accepting this is part of a much bigger shift in thinking. I think the day I realized that doing something that would only have an internal value that would probably be invisible to the outside world or to my work or to any of those other doing aspects of life helped me to turn a corner in terms of self-confidence. Genuine belief in and knowing the value of self, investing in myself without needing to justify it in any way. And this leads me to another point about change, about how we either embrace it or resist it. And sometimes that's what self-development is about, changing ourselves, our way of thinking, or of approaching things. I've been asked more than once why change can be so frightening. And this is something that we could spend rather a long time discussing. But basically, change is something that we have a tolerance for. And the more practiced we are at it, the easier it feels. We have confidence in our ability to adapt. It's often pointed out to me that I change things up a lot, and this is primarily because I'm looking for better ways to do things. The furniture gets moved around a lot in my house, for instance, and things get put into service in ways that they were never intended to be used. But this is good. This employs many of the key factors of neuroplasticity, which in turn helps me to be more open to change, effectively keeping my brain fit. But if we let these skills lapse and depend on tried and tested neural pathways, habits and thinking that we've depended on for years, then change becomes more daunting and less appealing. Our brain, which has been surviving quite nicely without all this energy hungry upheaval, more or less says, no, thank you very much. (laughs) This is something I've talked about in previous episodes, so I'll link some relevant ones in the show notes if you want to check them out. And you know, now that I put it like that, It makes as little sense to let our thinking stagnate as it does to let our mobility stagnate, right? Which brings me back to why self-development is important, why exploring new possibilities within ourselves is important. We don't do yoga or take vitamins or eat well because it's going to improve our bank balance. We do it because it's going to make our experience of life better. But in a way, these things also have a tangible result. Our bodies stay in better shape, giving us better mood and better energy. And from experience, I can see that widening our horizons, our perspective on ourself and our relationship with self can greatly enhance that life experience too. Understanding ourselves can give us a much bigger canvas on which to paint the picture of our lives. 
Clearly, you can take the girl out of art college, but you can't take the art college out of the girl. And this helps me tie this up. All that instinctive exploration, all that air quotes, pointless learning, all of that was the hallmark of a mind that was full of the invincibility of youth, still forming masses of new connections daily in a world where new was the norm. But that point where I noticed that my thinking had started to weigh up the benefits of that exploration in terms of value for money was a clarion call. It's a bit like that first time, for those of you who've reached a certain age, that you realize that things were somehow just that bit more difficult to do than they used to be. When you started to think that jokes about bending down to tie your shoelaces and checking what else you could do while you were there were now relatably funny. The time is nigh, I thought to myself, maturity beckons. But in this, as in all things, I had a choice. As far as I could see, there were two kinds of maturity the sensible kind that knew what everything was worth and didn't waste energy on things that didn't contribute to my bottom line, or the kind of maturity that recognized that self-development was in fact a growing confidence in, respect for, and love of self. (laughs) Guess which one I chose. If you've come up against something similar, or if you want to avoid losing your ability to embrace learning or make change, then get in touch. The links are in the notes, but you can find me most easily over on LinkedIn or by heading to the website at ambitionincubator.com. We are all full of possibilities, unless we choose not to be. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to this, and I I hope it's given you something. And um, if it has, maybe I'll see you on the next one. Bye. Hey, before you go, I want to take a moment to say thanks for tuning into this episode of the Ambition Incubator podcast. And just check to make sure you know that you can join me each week for a deep dive, dynamic, collaborative reading of some business classics. You'll find all the information you need when you register for free at ambitionincubator.com forward slash BBC. I'll see you there.